I really want to introduce, however, our speakers today who are going to join us on storytelling. So, uh, Tamir Kadar, you're very welcome. Great to see you here. I know you were uh, joining us, and uh, it's great that you're here as part of this roundtable. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. And Doyle Bueller, who I introduced you to earlier. Doyle, you're very welcome. You're joining us from where today? Uh, today I'm in Sydney, Australia. Very good. Tamir, you're in London today, I'm assuming? Yeah, I'm, I'm in London at the university. I've just finished a session, a seminar, so I'm very happy to join. I could still hear Jason's amazing very good. Uh, session. Thank you. Very good. So look, let's kick off the discussion about storytelling. Uh, some of the points that I uh, noted was just the amount of different elements of the brain that are involved. And of course, when we add a story, it becomes much more powerful. But I want to throw it open to either Tamir or Doyle maybe to get us going. Have you any questions for Jason or have you any thoughts on what we've been talking about today in relation to how it applies in your world, in business, et cetera? Uh, if I if I can go ahead, just because when I went, when when Jason was uh, listing all the things the brain feels, it is exactly what I experienced when I did an an experiment, um, connect with stories, uh, storytelling, networking events online. It was in 2021, so you know after that year of uh, lockdowns and everybody was a bit overwhelmed by all the networking meetings where we just entered the Zoom and introduced ourselves. I'm an accountant, I'm a marketer and so on and so forth. So at this um, session, we said that we connect with stories. So I gave people one story idea, um, um, as, as, you know, something to talk about, like what was the first job that you, you have been ever paid for. And, um, and I put them into breakout rooms. And it was amazing, exactly as Jason listed all the things that, Instead of simply telling each other what they do, they started to tell the story of their first job, for example, and they started to smile at each other. They started to mirror what the speaker was talking about. Trust was built much quicker. And when we came back to the big room and I asked people to tell the stories of the other person and not their own, they remembered exactly as Jason did now with us with the with the ice cream and line and stuff like that. And you know what, normally you don't really remember what people do after talking to them and hearing that, okay, I'm an immigration lawyer or whatever, uh, but you remember these stories and you will be able to retell these stories to yourself and to other people. So it's, it's, it's just, as Jason was telling it, I just, I just remember this and wanted to share. So yeah, absolutely. And is it, is it possible that I can forget the image of Jason in a bath towel eating ice cream in New York? <laughs> is that, is that possible? Um, mm -hmm. Joking aside, uh, Jason made a point, didn't he, about the bit that I loved was when he was talking about connecting with people and you, you, you spoke Jason about data, but then you spoke about connecting and uh, how a narrative connects with the inside out, as opposed to the way a lot of people try to storytell from the outside in, coming in with numbers and statistics and facts. Whereas what you were talking about was narrative, connecting from the inside, you know, getting into the brain and then working work the other way. Doyle, have you any thoughts on that when it comes to storytelling or what were your observations or thoughts or any questions that it posed for you? Yeah, no, thanks, um, Jason, for the wonderful presentation. I'm kind of going along the lines of, we're not, I haven't found a lot of good storytellers and maybe Jason can kind of um, go into maybe some that might be good in the business world. And, and you said Richard Branson was definitely one of them. But what I've kind of experienced a lot and found is that most people, maybe you can kind of articulate how they're telling the story, but most people tell it like a, a founder's story of why they started the business and that kind of stuff. But to me, a story that really gets people going is one that kind of is that that journey of transformation, the Star Wars, you know, the Lord of the Rings, where it is, it's not about the business, that's just kind of a matter of fact item. And perhaps that's the data that we see here. But perhaps it's more of the stories that actually kind of bring people along that journey. It's not just about um, me and my business. Oh, we're great. We're a startup. We're doing this. We're doing that kind of stuff. But it becomes more of a narrative, like you mentioned, and a story of transformation that that's what they're actually going on. 
there, there was an element, wasn't there, about shortcutting straight straight to them? You know, J Jason, you used the term shortcutting, where you know by using analogies and metaphors, it was almost as though you were putting the other person into the story or the narrative. You know, um, which I thought was which was interesting. Maria, have you any any questions or thoughts on on the conversation so far? I think you need to just turn the mic on there, Maria. It'll get you every time, the mute button. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, because I'm tapping at the same time at the yeah, chat. Yeah, I understood. Yeah, so yeah. I usually turn it off. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was saying that I thought it was really interesting when Jason was talking about, like, the first part, when he was talking about which uh, brain help us make us take decisions about the root brain the instinctive one and all that because uh i've been reading a, quite a lot lately also because we were going to have this conversation and i found so much information and and i thought it, it was really interesting how we process language and which parts in, in our brain are activated by you know like different events and how the story develops into our brains like the sensory cortex and the motor cortex and it they activate just by words uh and i think that's amazing like we say depending on which words we use you know like um maybe we use um action words and that will motivate our motor cortex uh, or we use sensory words and that will activate our sensory cortex so maybe going back to what um doyle just said if we use stories that have to do with our own customers and we say something like the client felt supported like we talk about own stories that our latest client felt supported and taken care as if he was part as if we were part of his own family maybe that way we're making this other person we're talking with also felt that we are a big family we're making him feel part of something you know just with words obviously this all needs to be inside a story because that's what we're talking it's not just a sentence it's a whole story but just by using words and making them feel feelings we can do that so it's not only talking about star wars you know what i mean but yeah, like yeah. if we let them know how we made all the clients felt something with their own experience into our company. We can do that. I'm, I don't know. What do you think, Jason? Is would that be it, or am I wrong? I mean, I might be. No, you are right. Uh, what you suggested there. There's there's lots of different ways that we can connect with our audience, uh, depending on who our audience actually is. If it's a meeting. Um, I mean, we might want to take people through a journey of a, another client that we had mm -hmm. and find out their ups and downs and why things went well and what went wrong and show your humbling side to your vulnerability as well. Even when you present your story to a client, things don't go right, especially when you're a startup. Things go wrong all the time. Tell people how things went wrong. Tell them the stress, the cortisol, what actually happened along the way. Maybe the big thing that changed things to make you understand how you got so many customers. All of a sudden, things went well. And then you rise it with the customers that you do have and take them on that journey. But that's just one. You can have several different other uh, other stories but it does depend on your audience that you do have every story is going to be slightly different so you have to work out who your audience is what it actually is if you're in a meeting ideal scenario is get them to tell them their story don't kill them off with death uh by powerpoint no one likes powerpoint just have a conversation with them find out about them find out their value find out about their concerns tell them about how vulnerable that you are get that emotion going along 
get them to go straight inside your brain. So you build those emotions and the, that story with that. Uh, I believe that if you make people emphasize, emphasize with uh, the pain your other customers experience or you use uh, experience by building your own company, they will also feel the pleasure of your resolution or your customers' resolutions when you did help him, help them to overcome whatever it happened. And that will help you build uh, a strong relationship with those new customers. That's right. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, uh, Jason. Doyle, were you going to jump in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, is there a point, though, where storytelling becomes a bit too much in business world where it's like, look, I understand it's a great story, but let's just kind of get down to business type thing and get stuff done. Like, where is that line? Um, or is there a line? I'm just, just really curious. I think it's a great question. Can we be, can we overtell the story? Overtell you know? storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, like, it depends on the area uh, and the type of meeting that you actually have. Like, you don't want to overwhelm them with loads of stories because the meeting is about asking them questions and building up the value. Then once you get to a certain point in the meeting, yeah, you can build a narrative, you can build up a story, but it's, you're not going to overwhelm them with uh, a story unless it's uh, um, Disney or, or whoever it might be, then you, then yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's a different pitch story. Um, in a meeting or a business meeting, it is asking lots of good questions but then you can build it into a narrative and then you ask a lot more questions and hopefully they build a narrative back when you ask them lots of good open questions because that's a slightly different context. And uh... Yeah, that's a good point. And we've got some comments already coming in and I, I'll get to them. For, thanks to Chris and to Bernie Bernadette. I can see your comments. I will come to that in a moment. But I wanted to bring Tamir back into the conversation a little bit if I can. Because one of the things that it's highlighted for me, because, you know, I'm kind of immersed in the world of language and linguistics and localization and translation and all that good stuff. But this term visual language, it really has brought that to the focus for me. And I'm just wondering, Tamir, in your world, because obviously you work an awful lot with key marketing people across uh, many parts of the world. What do you think when we talk about this using this visual language? Um, yeah, a very good question, and it also I would also um, like to go back to what Doyle mentioned that a lot of people are not telling good stories in the business world, and that they are in a lot of cases they are also a bit um, reluctant to use it really, and this is because uh, they are not specific enough, and this is where I would bring in your visual words example that if I focus on a specific example and really use these visual words, which really uh, not just describe, but demonstrate what happened at that specific event or moment. So I'm not telling very general things that I've always been interested in interior design or something, but I'm just focusing and cutting on one specific event and using these demonstrative words that that works really perfectly and not just in meetings, but also on an about page or on a flyer or whatever, you know, on, as I said, in a networking or, or really um, pitch wherever. So absolutely. And this, this is sometimes it requires a little preparation and a little uh, research and, and because words really do matter. So you really have to be careful which one you choose, especially when you have time to prepare for that pitch or prepare for obviously whatever you write and put in writing. So yeah, this is what it means to me to be really specific and demonstrative instead of descriptive. Yeah, and it's positioning that story, isn't it, I suppose. Doyle, any more thoughts on that? Um, just I, I think that that's there's been a few points about making it very specific and like uh, Timmy was saying is is we don't want to have stories kind of rambling on we want to there is obviously a purpose so I think you have to pick and choose where you use them and where you leverage them and where you you know have sort of a, a strategic story that that's part of the journey um, you know as I was talking about earlier it's like make it more of a journey of, of a journey of transformation as opposed to just a story because if you look at like Gary Vaynerchuk for example like he's a great storyteller he focuses in on you know kind of the belief systems of of his audience so he can really tell some really great stories and you're captivated by it but 
at the same day, same time, rather, we're not Gary Vaynerchuk. So we kind of have to be very selective in how we tell stories and what we use them for and, and that sort of thing. So we don't want to be, you know, referred to as, as just somebody who, who rambles on about stories <laughs> as I ramble on. <laughs> Well, look, I want, I've got some great questions now that are coming in on the chat. So thanks to everybody who's, who's posting now. I'm, I'm going to go into these and maybe our panel here on this round table, maybe you can jump in with your thoughts, uh, whether it's Doyle or Tamir or Maria or Jason. Um, so let me, let me hit the first one. And the first question is, should we have several stories prepared depending on our audience j just to be prepared for those different personality types? What's, what are your thoughts on that? Anybody? Can I just quickly jump in? I think yeah. uh, uh, being in sales or in business, I think you have to have loads of experience stories that you can use at any particular time when you're speaking to customers, depending on the situation. So you can just bring loads of examples in about different customers or different situations. Um, that's what I would suggest to do. Alternatively, if you're on a big team, you can use other people's stories, but make sure that you tell them. Another customer had this experience and what they did was blah, 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 or whatever it might be. So you can have that, but it, it does depend on the audience. Uh, uh, can I just say that I totally agree with Jason. So I always prepare and obviously depending on who I will talk to, I select a story which will match that person, which that person can identify with and that person can see themselves in. And again, it needs preparation. So storytelling in business is not necessarily something that I will just now, you know, wake up and come up with something, but obviously it needs some kind of a research and preparation. So I agree with this. Yeah, And I think you need to tie them together as well so that it becomes, again, uh, it's not one long story, for example, it's kind of uh, smaller sections of related stories, it's like chapters, for example, like when I do a, a live presentation, um, you know, in a, a theater or whatever the case may be, it's, it's, I try to tell specific stories of each you know, one or two slides kind of thing. So in a business context, I kind of get the point across by relating it to a story, a metaphor, you know, that kind of thing that allows people to kind of sync with it and, and understand what, what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Doyle. And I, I just want to move it on if I can, just in the interest of time, because I want to get to some more of these questions. So Chris was saying that obviously agreed with your earlier point on that and that stories need to be very on point because he's making the, the point that you can tell when somebody's just been on a course and told them to tell a story, right? So <laughs> that sort of authenticity needs to kick yeah. in, right? It needs to be genuine, yeah. <laughs> relative, on point. And as you, you know, it has to, you were talking about linking them together, right? You can't just throw a story in for the sake of it. So that's a good point. So thanks for that. Uh, another question is, um, Use it, the use of uh, social media in storytelling, because you're limited to some degree, depending on what platform you're on, as to what you can uh, make an impression with. Um, if you're limited, you know, is there any sort of tips or any anything we should use for storytelling in a brief but powerful way, particularly around social media? Anybody want to jump in on that? Um, I mean, Hemingway, Hemingway had the six word stories. So that's you can you can look look it up and there are you know in six words you can tell a story if you follow the so it doesn't have to be longer it's possible absolutely yeah that's that's why Twitter came if you can tell a story on Twitter you're you're pretty good uh, a writer or copywriter or whatever so yeah look I would say for social media it's you have to perhaps you can look at it for two from two different ways one is kind of an overarching story as jason kind of outlined because obviously it has to be very short very concise very precise as well so you can kind of do an overreaching story that kind of bridges between these different points on one post or multiple posts or that sort of thing and one of the cool things i've seen on twitter in the last like six to nine months is how they create these multiple threads um, in relation to telling a story, because as you know, with what is it, 200 and how many characters, 268 characters, uh, you have to be very specific as well. So we have to kind of adapt to the medium that we're using. So with Facebook, it's a little bit longer, but we can't kind of miss those principles that really kind of allow us to, to be able to convey that story as well. I've got an interesting question here, you know, uh, 
I have imposter syndrome telling stories because English is not my first language. How important is the language and using the right words? So probably I can jump in here as English is not my first language, but my chosen one and that I've put a lot of effort into learning. And, you know, obviously language is important and you have to use words which the audience can identify with, but in a lot of cases it's in your head. The audience is usually happy with that. So yeah, obviously I, you have to speak it to, to, to an extent and you have to prepare for it, but in most cases it's in your head that English is not in, not your first language. Really? So that's but uh, yeah, and and at the same time, like just just practice. Like don't don't worry about it. We, I think we're all. I mean, know your audience, right? We've said that a few times, and and that your audience knows that maybe you're not a perfect speaker, but at least you're trying, and and you can kind of figure out the story along the way as well. So yeah, don't worry about imposter syndrome. Like just go do it and practice, right? Yeah, I'm not perfect in French. I, you know, grew up in a French family and that sort of thing and, and spend time in French cities um, in Canada. But at the same time, like I'm not a French speaker, so I can comprehend it. But you know what? Just get out there and practice. I think if you understand the principles, then then you will get better and you will use the right words. Um, I do agree when you try to express feelings. I'm sorry, sorry Jason, that I, I, when you try to express feelings, I do have that problem sometimes that I'm trying to tell a story. I'm trying to express my feelings or really telling them how it felt at that moment. And English is not my first language. And sometimes words are not the same. I'm sorry. I mean, we do not have the same vocabulary and I just feel like I'm out of words and I'm like, yeah, you, you know what I mean? I would love to really express myself. So that's maybe why I use my hands and my, so maybe she can do that. Maybe she can use her body language too. I mean, now we have video chats, you know, so it's like you can use your body language too and, and show them what you're trying to say. I know it's not the same when you're writing an article, but if she's in a video, a call or something with a client maybe she can do that too i don't know sorry jason thanks for it. jason right. you're going to say something imposter syndrome happens to us all no matter of your language it doesn't make any difference i'm not good enough i can't do that or whatever it might be we all get it all the time it's one of those things that we have to practice i practice 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 i record myself i video myself and I listen to myself all the time. Probably other people are getting sick of that, but I even close my ears and I listen to myself. I record myself, I video myself. I have to get over that. And the only way to get over imposter syndrome, and it happens to us all when you're public speaking, is the number one fear that builds up that cortisol in our brains. I'm not good enough. People are laughing. They don't know what you're going to say. So it doesn't matter. Use your personality. Practice, 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 practice. And um, I, I know we're all saying that. And we all agree that the first time I ever stood up in a public audience uh, many years ago, I was very, I was shaking, almost swore then, but I was shaking like a leaf. But I knew that I practiced for about a week up to that. Uh, and But we all get that. But the only way to do it is actually stand up and, do it. That's why Toastmasters and uh, PSA public um, speaking is really good. Toastmasters is excellent for that. Just trying to get yourself over the, the pre nerves, regardless of the language. I've seen some incredible people that don't speak native English. I can't speak Spanish. Apologies. I can I'd probably get a beer, but that's as much as it can go. Well, look, thanks, Jason. It brings me on. I, I want to squeeze in one last question because I know we're really up against it for time here. And then I'm going to go quickly around the round table here and just get any of your thoughts just as we wrap up this round table. The last question, I just want to squeeze in one from Eleanor who asks, how important is it to begin with a personal story to illustrate your why to establish the know, like and trust factor faster? So what about the personal story? Any, do you want to jump in on that? I was going to say that's uh, normally the hero story, how you came to be. So that's a really good thing to do. It gets instant connection, instant likability. One of the child evening's laws of influence and persuasion is that connection, that likability, that trust. And when you're showing your vulnerability, that is just absolutely amazing. 
doesn't matter whether you're shaking, people actually jump into your brain and go, I've been there and we all have been there. So I think that's just, if you can do that, that's incredible. That's really, really tough to do. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And once again, it has to be specific. It's not just something general. So really demonstrating and I really use it. So when I talk about, you know, how I, I, I started a business because of my dad and I explain it, which I won't do here. But what happened, I did it at a, at, a, at a networking event. And six months later, when I went back, people came to me that, oh, you were the one. And they remembered what I told them six months before. So absolutely, the only thing that we've already said that it shouldn't be a long, long, long story, you know what, uh, covering everything since I was born and went to you know the schools. But yeah, it's a great idea. And I think that relates to what Jason said earlier. People were, you sort of had anchor points in your story and they could remember that story six months later, right? Yeah. That's really absolutely. relevant. Doyle, yeah. were you going to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to say that, um, yeah, it, it can be super important in terms of um, conveying that story and getting people to know, like, and trust you as well. So, uh, you know, like Marvel does a pretty good job in DC Comics of it, of having, you know, the origin stories, which are can be pretty deep. You don't want to be able to to tell that length of story unless you have the audience and the platform and the medium but the point is is that yeah there's definitely some strategic advantage to doing like an origin story but put it in context and make sure that it kind of fits with that overall sense of you know what platform are you on and um what is sort of the medium of the presentation as well well, look, it's been fantastic uh, to be joined by everybody today. And I do want to thank everybody in the audience as well for their questions. Before we wrap up, I just want to go quickly around and ask Jason, Tamir and Doyle and Maria, do you have any last sort of comments on storytelling before I close this uh, roundtable today? Maybe, maybe uh, Tamir, can we start with you? Yes, I'd like to echo Jason, practice it and if and, and it will come. So that doesn't have to be perfect. First, practice it in a, a smaller team or just with one person as you talk to and then you can grow. So it's really researching and preparation and practice. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for being Thank you for thank you. Thank you, Tamir. Doyle, maybe over to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Simon. And uh, thanks, Jason, as well. Wonderful presentation. Um, and Maria as well for co-hosting. Um, I, I just want to make, you know, a specific comment in terms of just, just understand what it is your audience is looking for. So, you know, people didn't come here or people are listening to you for a certain reason. So make sure you kind of look at that strategically. I'm not just here to tell them about myself. I'm here to tell them about, you know, that journey of transformation as well. So be strategic in your thinking in terms of what, why am I telling this story, you know, and how is it going to move them along that journey as well? And uh, you'll have a much more receptive audience. Thank you so much, Doyle. Uh, Maria, any last thoughts from you? Well, I would say that in a world where we're bombarded by information, a great story helps you cut through the noise and grab the attention of customers who will at the end feel passionate about staying with you for the long term. So as we already say, use all the weapons you have, written words, oral words, body language, everything you can you know thankfully we're, we're in a world where we can video chat or we can write a post uh, so we have a lot of weapons that we can use on our behalf so do it a lot of, a lot of tools available thanks yeah. maria jason last thoughts with you sir any anything you want to add just before we wrap up i think i've probably said it all really <laughs> <laughs> I, you've I would covered a lot like... jason you've covered an awful lot today yeah. i did i did humor uh, uh one of the key things is humor and smiling is another thing of likability so adding that as and when it's uh required just to make things a little bit light depending on the situation thank you so much indeed well look that brings us to the end of this edition of the think global forum roundtable discussion please make sure to join the Think Global Forum newsletter that I mentioned at the start. So just head over to thinkglobalforum.org, register for the newsletter, and that way you can keep informed of any future events that we're running. Uh, and also be sure to connect with the Think Global Forum on social media. We're on all the normal platforms, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So if you're not connected to the Think Global Forum there, please do. We'd love to have you join the community there. One additional final note uh, from me is we will be launching the sixth year of something called the Think Global Awards later this year. 
Uh, so keep a lookout for that on all our social media and our newsletters. And you can always find out more about the Think Global Forum at thinkglobalforum.org. So listen, thank you very much indeed to Jason Cooper, to Tamir Kadar, to Doyle Bueller, to Maria Roja, and to everybody who's joined us today. We hope you've enjoyed this roundtable discussion on storytelling, and we hope it's put that topic of visual language uh, to the top of your agenda when you're considering storytelling going forward. So thank you, everybody. We hope to see you at another Think Global Forum event in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, bye. Thank you.